Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us today on this first ever Pakistan's uh, digital um, you know, presentation on women and financial inclusion on the SSF, uh, SFF um, uh, technology chapter. So uh, my name is Parva Tapal. I'm the founder and CEO of Iran, which is the first women-led and first women saving solution in Pakistan, which is actually why this topic is also very dear to me. You know, women and financial inclusion in Pakistan is something that I personally have been working towards for the last two years and actually moving the needle on that and um, interacted with many different people, um, understanding their needs. Um, and Amna is somebody, you know, who she's come from the development sector and has a very uh, interesting perspective, which we're going to be speaking, um, which she's going to tell us as well today. Um, joining us shortly, we were just waiting for Noor Saab as well, and he's joined us right now. So you must have heard the panel before, you know, market leaders um, and industry leaders in the, in the fintech space and talking about financial inclusion and women in financial inclusion in Pakistan. And that follow up is actually very interesting with this fireside chat where we have two opposite perspectives, you know, one from the development sector and one from the state bank government sector with Noor Saab. Um, so uh, let's kick this off. Um, I actually want to introduce them a little bit before I even get further into the talk. You know, um, Amna comes from, um, you know, she's actually works at Karanda. She's a general advisor, a financial advisor, gender financial advisor for Karanda's. Karandas works on financial inclusion, and Amna has been improving digital financial inclusion for Pakta for women. She's actually previously uh, also worked with various donors on really empowering women and, uh, and improving the economic uh, state. On the other hand, and she's going to talk further about herself, uh, but to give you a little bit more, Noor Ahmed Saab is actually works for the State Bank of Pakistan on implementing financial inclusion, microfinance banking, and agricultural credit policies. He's been involved in designing a number of innovative instruments for credit enhancement and broader financial uh, inclusion policies for women, which is a lot of what, you know, the initiatives, the interventions we really want to understand from his perspective today um, that he's very excited to talk about. So, Noor Saab, do you want to start off telling us a little bit more about yourself and then Amna? Uh, thank you uh, uh, for that uh, introduction. I think... Uh, Without further ado, I would go and ask, answer the question that why uh, women financial inclusion is important and uh, what is it to the central bank and why do we see, you know, there is need for uh, specific intervention in this space. Uh, to start off, uh, I mean, financial inclusion is clearly a, a national uh, goal that we are trying to achieve and since 2015, we adopted a broader national financial inclusion strategy. Uh, but having, you know, said that, why did we need that? And, you know, what is in that strategy? So I will not go into that immediately. But uh, to create the basis for that, we did a demand side survey in 2015, uh, which told us actually that the access level in Pakistan is very low, uh, apart from the global index numbers that I think he's having a, I think the connection is a bit tough. He just has been joining on and off. Let's give okay, it a few I'm, minutes. I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead, Noor Saab. You were talking about, you were actually getting straight into it and talking about financial inclusion and what does it mean okay. for Pakistan and okay. uh, specifically so women. Number one, inclusion is important because we want uh, as a national policy for individuals and firms in Pakistan to be enabled and in terms of having a formal access to a bank account, primarily to make uh, their payments, you know, right now in today's current time digitally. But at the same time, they should be able to save, uh, gain access to credit and insurance and, you know, other value added products and services for their life cycle needs with affordability and uh, what you can say is uh, quality as well. So that's the broader national financial inclusion goal. Uh, the headline target we adopted is for having a bank account, uh, you know, at least a digital banking account whereby they can meet their day-to-day -day requirements. Now I was uh, talking about uh, the targets. Uh, why did we have, you know, uh, specific targets for gender back in 2015? 
uh, because the access to finance survey it told us that women are half as likely to have you know access to a bank account as compared to men in pakistan and i think that's a global trend and another trend that i would like to emphasize here uh, on this forum is that uh, as we include more uh, you know people women women are more likely to be left behind uh, from men you know so for example if you uh, were to increase financial inclusion you may have good uh, progress on overall numbers but if you look at the gap between the men and women uh, of having accounts actually uh, they further fall behind so Am I back or I think I, I, you lost me You're for back. a bit? Okay. Yeah, uh, we lose so you for that, three seconds and you see, come back. Th that's why we see, you know, there has to be a focus on uh, gender within any national financial inclusion efforts. And there has to be specialized focus. And, uh, you know, we, we had that from uh, 2015 and onwards. Okay, thank you so much, Nusab. You know, you've highlighted that bank accounts are a major, are actually the key metric we're looking at, you know, and digital bank accounts, and that's how we want to include women um, in the financial space, right? Um, and unfortunately, um, no matter what happens, women, there's a big gender gap between male and female opening up bank accounts. Um, and, you know, I'm really glad you've highlighted that because um, the reason, one of the reasons we know is why financial inclusion for women is so important is because 50% of the population globally and in Pakistan is actually women. However, only 6% are financially included um, out of 14% adults in Pakistan. Um, you know, these are these are stark numbers and Pakistan feels it just as much as the global forum, you know, and we're, we're, we're been trying to move the needle. And we've been taking initiatives since, um, I think, the last five to eight years. You know, the panel before us also talked about um, how we've been trying to do a lot, but it never feels like it's enough. Um, Amna, what do you have to say? Because I know, I know that, you know, from Karan Daz's perspective, there's a lot of research that has happened in understanding what is the need for financial inclusion for women and what is um, what kind of products or what kind of solutions um, do you feel and ideas that have come out from this research? So, um, hi everyone, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, discussion. And uh, thank you, Nusab, for all your uh, valuable comments uh, on the financial inclusion side. And I think uh, he's pointed out the right trends as well. Uh, so, just to start off with uh, how we defining financial inclusion, and I think it was rightly pointed out at the basic level, we measure it by the access to bank accounts. And then we often assume that when we're talking about financial inclusion, we uh, refer to it, as, to it as access to credit. But actually, there are a lot of other services that uh, women need and that all users need, uh, which includes uh, savings, investment products, insurance products, etc. Uh, so it's important to improve access to all of those uh, services for all sections of the society, including women. And as Nusa pointed out, even though we are making strides, we are making improvements, but women are being left farther and farther behind. Uh, unfortunately, Pakistan is one of the very few countries where the gender gap in financial inclusion has actually uh, increased. And as the index data does uh, point out towards that. So over the span of three years, the gender gap increased from 16% to 28%. And that's uh, just for financial inclusion. And then we want to improve things on the digital side as well, but on the digital side as well, the gap is quite large. So it was uh, standing at 41% uh, in 2017. Uh, so even though overall financial inclusion has improved in the country, women have not benefited. This is something that's uh, peculiar to South Asia. We've also seen similar trends in Bangladesh. And this means that we need to make uh, interventions in order to address this trend. Otherwise, it, it seems that things are not going in the... Uh, right direction. And of course, it's extremely important to target women. Uh, one is, uh, of course, there's a developmental reason, because once you start uh, focusing on women, then that means that the entire household stands to benefit because of women's uh, empowerment, women's economic growth leads to improved indicators for the rest of the family as well. 
Uh, but also at the same time, it's an equity issue as well. So you can't leave half of the population behind. Uh, so women would have to be targeted and we need to be more deliberate in our interventions. And that applies to both the public sector players and it applies to private sector players as well. Both of them will have to be more uh, intentional uh, in the interventions because with the public sector, you can have more uh, scale. Uh, they can fix infrastructure level problems. And with the uh, private sector, then that is where a lot of services are offered to consumers. A lot of actors in the population engage with those businesses. So that's a way that is commercially sustainable and that can help improve things in the long run. Uh, so both sides would have to come forward to address this uh, gender gap. Otherwise, uh, it just seems that things are getting worse. <laughs> Absolutely, Amna, you know, um, you touched upon the fact that, uh, you know, the the need for this is also because women may not only make up 50%, but it's a household need. And then as such, it becomes an economic need, you know. Um, there's so many economic, there's a social justice economic opportunity um, that Pakistan and, and worldwide is not being captured by products or women being included. Um, and that is something I believe that both sides are really working to. So, you know, um, uh, coming back to you, Noor Saab, you know, what market, what do you see, you know, as opportunities and market gaps? Um, can you hear us? I think there's a bit of... Yes, uh, I think uh, I'm back and I'm connected through another device. So hopefully this, this connection okay. is better. Uh, yeah, uh, thank definitely. you for the question. Uh, it is very important uh, that we need to understand what are the gaps and uh, we are mindful of the gaps. Uh, Amna raised some of those issues. Uh, but, you know, it's all about making uh, the policy enabling for uh, women to participate in the formal financial system. But apart from that, you know, there are actually uh, two types of gaps. Uh, one is the supply side and the other could be, you know, uh, demand side and uh, demand side gaps, uh, you know, is primarily about uh, women are, are not, you know, as digitally included as uh, as you would like them to be. You know, the, the gaps, uh, there may be, you know, estimates indicating that. Uh, digital connectivity is half of what actually uh, men are equipped with and that needs to be enhanced. So that means, you know, more mobile phones and, you know, uh, we are bringing up actually solutions uh, that won't require data connectivity. So we are uh, thinking of maximizing the use of USSD channels, you know, uh, because we've seen in this panel as well that data connectivity is not that as reliable even uh, with institutions. So you know, let alone the, the private uh, individuals. Uh, so having said that, you know, channels, uh, multiple channels have to be opened up for that. And uh, on the policy sides, you know, there are issues with documentation, like, you know, they may not have the, uh, you know, mobility as well as documentation. So those have to be improved. So digital will solve some of those issues as well. Uh, for example, in Pakistan, uh, the branchless banking regulations have been relaxed and now uh, accounts can be opened remotely through uh, the, this universal ser service, uh, su uh, you know, uh, supplementary code uh, that these mobile operators, which are branchless banking providers, are providing. So I would like to share some numbers on that front, uh, you know, so it's not that bad in terms of the achievement. Uh, we have seen, uh, you know, uh, a tremendous uptake in account ownership among women as a result of these enablements. Uh, uh, if I were to share some numbers, so in 2015, uh, the level of account ownership in Pakistan, the total account uh, universe was on only 52 million. Now we have, as of September, 114 million accounts. Uh, and these are not uh, unique accounts, but we have a unique account database uh, that we're compiling. So there are about 73 million adults of 110 million adult population in Pakistan who have a bank account. Now, if we come to women, uh, of that 18.5 million women have a, a bank account. These are unique women I'm talking about. But the real challenge is to make these accounts active and, you know, uh, so that women can use it frequently for them. Uh, day, -to day to day needs. So of, of that, uh, there are 11.5 million accounts which are active, women accounts which are active. Uh, on the branchless banking front only, uh, we have about 13 million accounts which are owned by women there. So I'm the 
5 million is basically the total uh, universe that includes the conventional banking accounts in branchless banking, which are digital types of accounts. But at the same time, uh, 13 million, which are not unique, are opened by branchless banking off lately. And we've seen that since 2015. So there has been a massive uptake there. Uh, we are uh, going to increase that number going forward quite a lot. On other interventions, you know, if we were to talk about interventions on uh, the supply of credit, uh, I have a couple of schemes, so perhaps uh, I can share that in the next round of questions. Just as he's about to share it, he gets cut off. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the tech is telling you, okay, let, let's hold off for a bit. So, you know, you, you raised some interesting numbers and it's true, right? Like while, uh, and I'm sure that the fact that the last year, it's been, it's been a tough year for everybody, but it's also been a sort of a um, opportunity for the digital space because every, every industry when it comes to tech and digital has sort of boomed because all of us, and, and one of the initiatives State Bank has taken, um, which is actually really good, to be honest, we see it at Oran as well with our women, and is um, ensuring that there's no transaction fee um, for, for people to transact. And unfortunately, unfortunately, but that is actually a main, a big reason why people all of a sudden feel comfortable. They're not thinking about saving that buck, but instead sending it and, and have more reasons and use cases to actually um, use these bank accounts. And I'm sure that's part of the reason why you're seeing this number jump in the last uh, couple of years, in the last year, in fact. Um, so, you know, um, I would like to actually ask, um, now, you know, he talked, um, uh, Nursab talked more on the supply side. Um, you know, on the demand side, what do you think um, is, is financial institutions can do and or the development sector can do to help facilitate or find opportunities um, for women's needs, financial needs, and what can be highlighted. Okay, yeah. Uh, so I think on the uh, demand side, there are uh, several constraints right now, several uh, blind spots that we see. And uh, it's a good thing that I did highlight the numbers, but overall what we've seen is that also there's just a dearth of data as well. Uh, women yes. generally tend to be invisible in a lot of uh, economic activities. And we also see that uh, in this case, that businesses are not aware, financial institutions are not aware as to how many women are there, what are they doing. And uh, even when we try to improve things through digital financial inclusion, then uh, SIM cards are not registered in women's names. So again, we don't know how many Absolutely. are uh, using those. And uh, banks do struggle uh, to meet uh, women's needs as well. Uh, we've seen some good work happen. Uh, on the microfinance side, but once you move on from microfinance to, let's say, the small businesses, uh, then women do definitely tend to become uh, invisible and financial institutions are unsure of how to uh, meet those needs. Uh, the ticket size is small, uh, women don't have enough information, uh, collaterals are often not present. And uh, then if uh, there are other needs that have to be met, so for example, if women have small amounts that they want to save or invest, then there aren't uh, enough uh, products available, or if there are, then there isn't enough variety. So I know Iran is doing some good work in that space, but you don't have a lot of examples of uh, what kind of products and services can women access. Uh, so yes, for banks to address women's needs, it seems that it's going to be expensive because uh, women are hard to reach, have mobility issues, you have to provide them information, and then the final uh, loan product is also going to be uh, small. Uh, so for that, it's important to uh, change the operational structure and change the product offering, and that is how you manage uh, your costs. And uh, digital solutions actually does provide a good uh, option as well for moving forward because it does address the mobility constraints that we do see in some parts of the country. Then, of course, there are exceptions as well. So, for example, in KP, you see that the uh, level of cell phone ownership amongst women is still very low. And that is because of the cultural norms and uh, the way those people uh, interpret religion and the practices that they follow. Uh, so, yeah, digital inclusion might be a problem in that area. But for the rest of the country, through using a digital financial services, you can improve uh, access for women. Uh, at the same time, it's important for financial institutions to focus on women as a segment as well. They have not done that historically. So, of course, they don't have enough data on how profitable and lucrative that is going to be. Uh, but that's something that needs to be done. So you focus on the segment, you design products that, need, that meet 
uh, women's needs. So maybe they have needs, uh, it, maybe students have needs, uh, they have educational expenses to meet, uh, their housewives who have consumption uh, expenses to meet, then there are businesses as well uh, that are led by women. Uh, so you'll have to design products that address uh, those specific needs and more work needs to happen in that area as well. And with the opening up of digital uh, finance, then that means that there's more room for innovation as well. Uh, so that is one way in which the private sector can come forward and help improve things in this space. Okay, uh, Amna, you... If I may uh, add to, to, to what Amna has just said. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, basically the central bank is also thinking along the same lines as uh, Amna has uh, shared. Uh, what we're looking at is, okay, what is the common, uh, you know, need or denominator since majority of Pakistani women are basically home uh, makers. So they have, you know, have to have this access to a basic uh, banking account, uh, which should be ideally in digital format and they should be able to remotely access it. And then we have the branches banking network uh, that is quite large, which is uh, around over 400,000 agents. Uh, these agents are serving us, uh, you know, low income communities largely and, and small, uh, you know, ticket transactions. So that is the way forward for us, actually. And then at the same time, what we see in the second uh, phase is that we need to enlarge the access points. So we're bringing in policies on, uh, you know, the agents are there, but the digital merchant onboarding process and then our guidelines on QR code. So the acceptability network becomes uh, larger for these women to use these accounts for day-to-day -day requirements like purchasing groceries or making, you know, bill payments or fee payments uh, through the agents or directly from these accounts when they, they're equipped with that account. Once that is enabled, then data points, you know, ar ar around the digital, you know, uh, footprint of these uh, uh, women will, will have actually, uh, you know, a, a profound impact on, value-added services for these particular women uh, in terms of credit, insurance, and other, other product and services. So that's perhaps sort of, uh, you know, the building blocks of financial inclusion of women going forward in Pakistan. And this is very much part of our national strategy. So that's the national vision that we've adopted. Okay. Um, that's very, very interesting to understand, you know, the inter the initiatives that you are taking um, in, you know, the uh, it's two parts, right? It's not only building the digital accounts, but also creating that space and, and network um, with these agents on ground that women can reach. Because as Amna has pointed out, there's a lot of challenges, mobility issues, cultural barriers, um, you know, household barriers with women actually, uh, while we build these products, it's very tough to actually get them to use it. Um, and I believe that's exactly what you're also saying that, you know, how do we actually create those solutions that are um, not just targets, but that how what, how can we get them to use it? What makes sense for their lives? And there's so many different types, right? While we have spent decades building products for men, um, you know, of all ages, of all socioeconomic backgrounds, of all uh, personality types, um, we're just starting to scratch the surface with women products, right? And there has to be a range. It's not one fits all. Um, and so these are, we're starting at the bottom and going upwards as well. So in this process, you know, what are the challenges that you feel um, are the one, the public sector or government side faces in, in actually making, moving that woman to actually use the things that you build? Um, I'm, I'm a first Nusab. And then Amna, what do you feel is that what do you guys see is that challenge or what do these women say then when you when you put these products out of them? What do, do what do they say? Um, you know, how do they receive these products and you know what what is their, their feedback? I, you know, I think that'd be a good point for our audience to understand as well. So, uh, thank you. Uh, that, that, that's an important uh, you know a question that you've asked. Uh, you know, what are the challenges and the challenge you've raised in your question as well, uh, the mobility <laughs> question, the security question, and yeah. of course, uh, you know, a lack of access to these documentation. So what we've been trying to do is, uh, uh, you know, remove those barriers as much as possible. You know, Pakistan has a fairly developed financial market uh, compared to other uh, countries in the region. If we look at our banking sector, uh, there are quite a good number of providers out there. Uh, if, if we look at the non-banking sector, it's it's sort of, you know, 
uh, not as developed as the banking sector, but th there are quite a good number of institutions. And similarly, if we look at, you know, there are institutions like uh, uh, the Pakistan Post and uh, CDNS, uh, Central Directorate for National Saving. They're also serving uh, product and services to all Pakistanis. So uh, in terms of the, the outreach, that is there. But, you know, it's not you're absolutely spot on. It's not for women, actually. Uh, the women focus has been missing so far. Uh, so before I, I go into what, what are we doing going forward in the future, I would like to say, state this upfront that, uh, that women focus has to be brought in uh, that. And uh, what we initially thought that if we were to push financial inclusion, you know, on all fronts with equal force, uh, things are going to move, uh, you know, or happen with, uh, with the same likelihood. But that's not the case. That was 2015 when we did that, and uh, we actually uh, sort of realized some of the goals. Uh, we have achieved the number of accounts that we targeted, like, you know, uh, we said 50% of the adults in Pakistan will have an uh, account uh, with a formal institution. So we have that. We said that 25% of those accounts will be owned by women. We have that. But when you look at the active accounts, that is not there. So really the real uh, issue is you know having those product and services tailored for women i'm not saying that there isn't progress there is a lot of progress because of the you know these most of these accounts are branchless banking which provides the comfort you know uh, uh, you know for immobile women to uh, you know open these accounts at, at, at a distance you know from anywhere in pakistan uh, on their own network so what we are trying to do is bringing uh, an Asan mobile account uh, sort of platform for Pakistan, uh, which is in the development and uh, in, in the licensing, you know, so it is going to be licensed by jointly by State Bank and, and ETA. So uh, all the four mobile networks will be open to all branches banking providers. And there will be a single code. That single code is meant to provide, you know, accessibility uh, to, to everyone. But at the same time, simplicity is very important. So the real challenge for us is not only, you know, having an account, actually, we want to bring in an alternative to cash where people can, you know, move, uh, uh, you know, shift from cash to digital uh, because uh, it is so easy to use, uh, you know, open an account and use that account uh, and with multiple use cases uh, that are available, you know, that, that can be possible, right? And all the use cases can be shared across various providers. So... Uh, the real challenge, you know, we have good number of institutions, but there is a silo approach. That silo approach has to be break, yeah. uh, broken down. We need a platform Absolutely. approach where the industry can get behind, you know, uh, intervention uh, and also give it a big push from both marketing side as well as usability side so that more and more women and, and, and men can adopt digital uh, uh, payments in Pakistan. Uh, at the same time, we are also, uh, you know, Amna is here and I need to, uh, you know, appreciate the efforts of Karandas, which is collaborating with State, State Bank. And we are trying to uh, develop the, another platform, which is called Micro Payments Gateway, uh, and which is going to be short, shortly launched. So that is going to be a flagship uh, intervention that is going to bring in a major change in, uh, in the payments landscape in terms of usability as well as accessibility and affordability. So all these three aspects will be met through uh, that piece of uh, platform or infrastructure that is going to be shortly launched. So we are working on, uh, to summarize this, on various policy interventions. We, we are opening up, reducing the barriers uh, for women in terms of, uh, you know, policy, uh, uh, you know, enablement. And at the same time, we are also bringing in infrastructure, both private sector and public sector. And we see a collaboration going forward where these efforts can come together and help us uh, achieving the national goal of universal financial access for both men and women. These sound amazing. Very excited to see some of these initiatives come out, to be honest. Uh, they, and glad to hear you talk about them right now. Um, Amna, what about you? What is your perspective, you know, on the challenges faced um, and especially in the, the initiatives you guys have taken at, through Karandas and you've seen donors take? Yeah, I, I think uh, Nursab did mention uh, about the private sector players, but uh, what I'd like to add is that the State Bank has also been a very uh, progressive uh, regulator and we've Absolutely. seen a couple of... Uh, 
uh, schemes and interventions being launched in the previous years as well. Uh, so recently there was the gender policy and before that you had the a refinance scheme as well. And apart from that, quota is also assigned uh, for uh, financing uh, women as well. Uh, so yeah, all of that is in place, uh, but uh, still we see that uh, there is a lag in improving uh, women's uh, financial inclusion. Uh, so it's, it's important to align incentives for all of the actors. So starting from the regulator, but then going on to the private sector entities and then going on to the final consumers as well. Uh, so maybe improving awareness in that area, uh, improving transparency of how those schemes are implemented. Uh, so that's also something that uh, Karan Daz is looking at, and that should help. Uh, apart from that, the, as with the response from women is uh, concerned, of course, uh, there are also apprehensions, and apprehensions are based on preconceived notions at times as well, because women are scared of documentation. So they haven't tried these services, and for this reason, they also struggle to understand uh, what is on uh, offer, and since women do uh, lack information, they're not part of networks, etc. And they, they find it difficult to meet documentation requirements as well. So that is why they uh, tend to uh, stay behind uh, in this space. And at the same time, when we interact with uh, private sector players as well, we do see uh, interventions, uh, we do see ideas for improving awareness, for example. But we also want to see more concrete business models, and we want to see people come up with uh, business incentives that would help women change uh, their preferences as well and would address the, whatever the needs of women are. And uh, that is how norms are changed. So you have to offer the right economic incentives. So we want to see more action happening in uh, that space as well. Uh, we do hope that uh, technology would help to uh, address some of these gaps, some of these barriers as well. And uh, for this reason, as Musab mentioned, so Karan Daza and State Bank are uh, working on launching uh, MPT, which is a micropayments gateway. And that does mean that there will be greater uh, interoperability uh, between different networks as well. So it would be easier to send payments for all uh, actors in the society. And also, uh, so State Bank is uh, implementing that system, but then we're also connecting that with uh, BISP, uh, with the uh, VISP payments. And uh, so that is a program that's specifically targeted at women and it's targeted at women from the low income segments. Uh, so that would be a huge step forward in improving the financial inclusion uh, needle as well, uh, because uh, there are a large number of payments made. Those, pay those women are, uh, are left out of the financial inclusion space. So now all of them would be able to have uh, an account in their name. And uh, that's what our research also shows. Uh, uh, that's also the mandate of the Gates Foundation that once women have a bank account in their name, then that means they can save money. Their savings are going to be private. The other people are not going to find out how many savings they have. So that's beneficial for them. Uh, but also we've seen that in other parts of the world that this is one way which re really helps to improve uh, financial inclusion for women. So we've seen this in uh, India, for example. So they also gave uh, bank accounts to low-income women, and at the same time, they launched their national payment infrastructure as well. Uh, so on one hand, women were motivated to contribute more to the workforce. The amount of time they were spending as part of the labor force increased because now those women knew that they could save that money. They had a bank account where they could keep that money, and it was private, so it was safe. And at the same time, just because the uh, payment system improved at the same time, so that also helped to uh, improve the needle on financial inclusion. And that is why I mentioned at the start of the discussion as well that Pakistan and Bangladesh are struggling in this space, but India has made improvements. So I think uh, both uh, State Bank and Karan Daz have taken a step in the right direction. And uh, hopefully this should uh, improve things on a larger scale. And that's the advantage of working with the government as well, that you can, uh, you can impact numbers on a big scale. And with the private sector, you can make improvements in businesses, et cetera, but you're not going to achieve the same scales that quickly. It's, of course, Mr. Noor, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Amna mentioned about a couple of uh, other initiatives, and yeah. I would like to make a note of that because, you know, these kind of forums are very important to us, and I think there may be women entrepreneurs out there, and uh, I think uh, there's an opportunity for us to publicize those uh, those facilities. As Amna has rightly pointed out, uh, those facilities are not as 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 well publicized as it should be, 
and hence we are f- facing challenges in terms of you know the uptakes but before i i go into the uptake issue uh, i would like to mention the state bank refinance scheme for uh, women entrepreneurs and there is a credit guarantee affiliated with that so you know there are two challenges there is an issue uh, of of course affordability affordability uh, and enablement on the financial services provide but at the same time you know they women lack documents uh, you know uh, ownership document to a lot of assets and that's why they need this guarantee so there is a 60% guarantee in that uh, the end user rate is uh, 5% uh, overall we give liquidity to commercial banks who are participating in the scheme at 0% so we charge uh, nothing on this facility there is a 20% quota for women entrepreneurs in balochistan specifically entirely for that uh we have had some success of lately uh the loan size used to be around 1.5 million rupees uh, under this facility uh for end user we've enhanced that we have re- lately interacted with the uh, women in tech uh and governor state bank uh, had a few meetings with them and then we realized that this amount may be you know insufficient for some of those entrepreneurs who are active in tech space so those women who are participating right now we have enhanced that limit to 5 million rupees it's uh, the rate is only 5% there is 60% guarantee so i have to say that upfront we are actively looking at women entrepreneur who have a large social media uh, what you can say is uh, following to uh, improve the facility uh, and also use this facility number one for themselves and also endorse this within you know their own women networks where this can the uptake can be enhanced so i would like to use this opportunity uh, to share some of the numbers as well uh, we have been able to disperse loans uh, of uh, to women entrepreneurs there are 737 uh, women entrepreneurs uh, who have uh, taken these loans some of these are also from tech uh the amount disbursed is over half a billion rupees so far but we would like to enhance it to uh, a few uh, you know uh, perhaps 100 uh, billion or plus you know given there is an uptake there uh but we have seen the uptake has been missing and awareness has been a challenge so i, I had to say that secondly uh, the government of pakistan has this uh, prime minister kamyab jawan youth entrepreneur scheme uh the financing limit is 25 million there uh there is a 25% quota for women entrepreneurs the interest rate is 5% only and 50% guarantee is being provided by by the federal government so that is also an opportunity for women who are in the entrepreneurial space that they can come and and avail the financial services but having said that you know access to credit has been you know uh lacking from the commercial banking side but as amna has pointed out if we look at microfinance and primarily if we look at the larger industry level the, the level of access you know is around 7 million borrowers of lately and half of that are women if we look at the micro banking industry the share of women is 25% of the 3.5 million borrowers so uh, there has been some good progress on the access to credit side for the low income segment we are trying in, trying to bring in more women entrepreneurs to the commercial bank through these uh, refinance and uh, prime minister scheme and that's the way forward uh, last bit on the financial literacy i think financial literacy is very important uh, because that creates financial capability uh, not only from you know uh, uh, women have to have actually uh, financial resources to 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 use it but at the same time and they should know how they can use those financial services to their advantage so we have a flagship national financial literacy program uh we have a couple of million target uh, for low income youth uh, you know segments half of that target is for women so we are right now actively engaged on that front as well uh so i mean efforts are needed but we have some sort of you know mechanism right now at least uh we are trying to reach out as much as possible uh and that's that's that, that, that that's where we are headed so our yeah. end uh, target for 2023 as a result of these initiatives and uh, amna mentioned about we have a gender policy that we have not issued yet so we are about to issue that gender policy shortly uh that is going to bring in you know uh, a holistic change in the within the supply side uh, you know 
And uh, if you want me, I can share, you know, in the next perhaps round of questions, if some of those initiatives those are going to be implemented because uh, th th there are actually big things that we are going to undertake under that in terms of targets as well as, but actions as well. We would love to hear more, actually, to be honest, if we were talking about gender policy, because I think there's two things I wanted to actually bring up before we get into gender policy. Um, one of the biggest challenges both of you guys are talking about is awareness. You know, while there is a lot of stuff out there, a lot of policies being put out, a lot of partnerships, collaborations, uh, products, um, but from both sides, what I'm hearing is the lack of awareness um, for everybody, right? Like women just don't know what is available for them um, to be accessing, not just uh, from a, uh, from the loan side, from the credit side, from the institutions that is available, from the youth of women, you know? I mean, you there's a lot, there's, when you say the 25% quota for even students, you know, there's a lot of young youth actually building up there, a lot of entrepreneurs, we see them, you know, um, being on ground as well. Um, I'm not sure what we can do to help, but I'm, I think that this is a great forum where you put this out there and I'm hoping that more people understand and hear about it. Um, and we'll definitely at Oran also talk about this further um, because we do see a lot of women come in, a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, one quick question, I'm, you know, we all talk about financial inclusion and women when we talk about the lower income. Um, is there something specific that you do that is slightly higher up middle income or lower middle income, you know, to address these issues? Because they can actually be aspirational for uh, women under uh, under them, right? And as well as the fact that these people are also not empowered. Um, another big thing I know Amna actually mentioned is that women really feel empowered when they have um, access to digital, uh, access to finance. And that is a game changer. As soon as you give them and pay, I think the payments gateway is going to be a big game changer as well, because that gives them the ability to make payments and empowers them to actually do something with money and not just save, but also spend. And women like to spend, of course, as well. Right. Um, and they have things to do. So when you put them in that position, um, hopefully it will empower them further. But um, just that quick question, you know, on, on uh, how, how are you addressing or how does how does both sides look at that um, that sector above, uh, you know, in the income level? Uh, Amna, do you want to tr take that or no, Mr. Nursab? Just a quick. Um, yeah, whatever works. Uh, should I go ahead first? Yes, go for it. Ladies first. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, actually, we do undertake a lot of interventions in this area in which we uh, try to work with uh, small and medium businesses as well and improve the. Uh, financial ecosystem as well, so that more and more women can be uh, included in this space. Uh, there are a couple of things that we are doing. So we have uh, challenge fund rounds, uh, Karandas rounds, uh, one round that's specifically focused on finding solutions uh, to the problem of uh, financial inclusion, or financial ex exclusion of women. Uh, so in that, we're looking for uh, innovative business models that can address that and improve things in the ecosystem as well. Uh, apart from that, we have another uh, funding as well, which is referred to as uh, Women Ventures, and that helps uh, small businesses scale up. So that's a simple scale up grant that a lot of businesses can do apply for, can qualify for as well, and helps them to grow. And uh, yeah, when we were interacting with these businesses, this is where we realized that a lot of them don't even uh, approach financial institutions because they don't feel comfortable. So we're helping them grow, but at the same time, we're also working to uh, improve the ecosystem so that they start feeling comfortable uh, approaching those uh, entities as well. Uh, we're also trying to address the problem of uh, data because um, we don't have numbers on uh, uh, what level are women included, where are they, what are they doing, and how can we attract them as well. Uh, so we do uh, experiments as well on the figuring out the right uh, channel to target women, the right incentives to offer uh, the right kind of products to be bundled. Uh, should we offer those incentives at high-end markets or at low-end markets? Uh, do we offer cashback facilities? Uh, how do we incentivize them to start using mobile wallets and then keeping more money in those mobile wallets? Uh, so we're also doing those experiments. And then 
uh, the idea is that we uh, mainstream gender in all of our interventions. So instead of looking at it in a silo on the side that only uh, some of the interventions are going to be gender sensitive, if you want to bring about a change in the society, we also have to start that change in our own portfolio. And that's the uh, intent that all of our interventions uh, would be viewed from that angle as well. And we would assess them to see where can we be a more uh, deliberate in targeting women as well. Uh, we're working with our partners on improving uh, the gender sensitivity of their business models as well and trying to work them to see where can, you know, uh, marketing strategies or sales strategies be improved or even HR strategies be improved to uh, include more uh, women. Uh, so those are the things that we're doing on the private sector side, but then also on the public sector side, there are uh, uh, players with, 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 that do promise a lot of scale as well. So. Uh, national savings is one uh, thing that is uh, popular amongst women. Half of the users already women. And we want to offer more services on that side as well so that they start I'm a big user. Uh, digital financial services. And of course, sorry? I said I'm a big user. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's popular amongst uh, women and men. And uh, yeah. of course, then there is a uh, state bank and BISB as well. And uh, we can use all of these channels to uh, attract more women uh, and convince them to start using uh, digital financial services. Thank you so much, Amna, for sharing. Mr. Noor, um, any, anything to share before? I definitely want to get into gender policy that you have been br you brought up. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I would just quickly, uh, you know, perhaps uh, agree with Amna. She has rightly said, I think, what we need is uh, to understand the market, I think. And for that, uh, data is very important. And uh, I would like to address that issue within the gender policy. So apart from data, I think uh, what, what is important is that, uh, you know, State Bank as an institution, uh, we have been, you know, it doesn't mean that uh, apart from the couple of interventions that I mentioned, uh, there are a number of refinance facilities that the state bank is giving to export sector and SMEs. And there is actually no gender discrimination in that. So women are, uh, you know, uh, encouraged as much as men. So it, it is a level playing field. But having said that, you know, when we are intervening and we are providing a certain subsidy, uh, there has been a focus on the low income segments primarily. But uh, State Bank has been flexible, especially, uh, you know, on, on this facility. Now we've since enhanced it to 5 million rupees. So it is perhaps uh, not the medium enterprise, but uh, somewhere in the middle of the small enterprise segment that we are targeting. And also the Prime Minister uh, uh, Kamyab Jawan scheme is also, uh, you know, has a maximum loan size of 25 million, uh, which is a sizable amount, uh, I think. What we see is, you know, uh, the financing needs, uh, and uh, this is from working with, uh, you know, some uh, women entrepreneurs and trying to, you know, facilitate them, sort of handhold them to and introduce them to financial institutions. So uh, when it comes to the real financing needs, they may not be as large, you know, when we look at especially startups and uh, women enterprises. Uh, but. I think the challenge is that they don't have the, the you know, the connections uh, or the or the awareness, you know, that they can go and reach out. Perhaps there is the fear factor that they can't walk into a, a bank, you know, and avail these services. So that has to go. First, they have to be aware of these facilities. And secondly, they have to be what you can say is confident that they can, uh, you know, uh, go to any bank and they can uh, ask for certain financial services. And if there are issues, so we have channels for that, so they can lodge a complaint to us on that. But having said that, so uh, there is, uh, you know, a lot of effort required on the upper income segment. I agree with you, uh, but we definitely need data. And data is a, a, a main issue that we would like to address through the gender policy. Uh, okay. Please, definitely. Um, so do you want to share a little bit more on the data side what how you are how you're looking to improve on the gen because that is you know I mean not only in Pakistan but across the world globally um, you know gender based data is very hard um, to get not it hasn't been happening 
So to find historically data and to segregate uh, in any sort of information based on gender is very tough. Um, and I believe that that's exactly what both of you are speaking about, right? How do we address these people? How do we address women? Which women do we address? What do they require? And what is what are the trends? Um, and so, what kind of policies are you thinking about, Mr. Noor? If you don't, if you can answer, go ahead. Otherwise, you know, yeah. uh, if thank you. Uh, so, what we when we look at the, the the entire universe of financial inclusion or excluded women, including. Uh, of, of the demand side, I think we have to be very clear that majority of Pakistanis are perhaps up to two dollars uh, a day earners. So we are talking about 60 percent, you know, of the population is there. If we want universal financial access, so I think in our uh, you know strategy, we prioritize that segment upfront. We said that these are th these women are going to have small amounts and their financing need is going to be smaller. So we came up with interventions, you know, broader intervention uh, on uh, microfinance. So if I were to share, you know, as instrument, it was introduced in back in 2000, microfinance banking. So it can not only serve credit services, but it, it is providing saving products. And the number of bank accounts that they've opened uh, are as many as the conventional bank accounts. So they are at par with the, the con conventional bank accounts and within the span of 20 years only. So that's the progress. So where the commercial banks stand, they started off since 1947 and they reached in 70 years. So they have achieved in 20 years. Uh, and a large segment of that is uh, owned by women because they work in these low income communities, which we are targeting up to $2 a day. And uh, they're serving their requirements. And we know that 50 percent of uh, them are women on the credit side as well. So that's the primary segment because that, that's where we're going to get the large numbers in terms of the inclusion uh, levels. Uh, now, going forward, uh, commercial banks, I would agree that uh, they have been, you know, uh, sort of a gender neutral approach uh, in our policies so far. Uh, uh, in terms of the data collection, so I, uh, we're talking about data now, so I'm not going to go jump into the product uh, site. So we've been receiving data from branchless banking and micro banks, you know, in gender disaggregated form so far. So we have that, you know, number exactly and we can say how many women are served there. But I don't have that kind of a data unless I do a specialized exercise, collect data from banks. And it's, it's not a regular part of report of the commercial banks to yeah. report to us on gender disaggregated. So we are going to change that under the, the new gender policy. They, they will have to report uh, to us not only in terms of accounts, which they are, they are reporting. So we started the gender disaggregated account ownership data reporting in 2017. Now I have the exact number of female accounts with unique CNICs owned by women, actually, uh, because the CNICs are issued the last digit is the same for all the men and women. There's a simple... Yes. simple so it was fairly easy exercise for us to tally those numbers. So we have that number. So we know exactly how many deposit accounts are there. But we don't want to stop there, actually. We want, uh, you know, all the banks to report to us that how many SMEs they are serving in terms of gender disaggregated format, of which small businesses, medium businesses, and large businesses will be separated uh, in, in terms of gender. You see, say, in similar way, uh, banks are serving, you know, around three and a half million uh, uh, agriculture clients. So how many of them are women? So they're going to report to us and on the housing segment, on the consumer financing. So they will have to report all the credit data and deposit data on gender, disaggreg in gender disaggregated form. And that is going to help us, you know, set targets as well. So data is not only important to understand the market, but we want to draw a baseline as well. Where do we stand? So in terms of account ownership, we have that database, uh, sorry, baseline established from day one. But we don't have the, the, the you know, as you were pointing out, uh, you know, uh, the targets for the upper income segments. And that is going to be introduced as a result of this gender disaggregated data. As we develop those streams, reporting stream through, uh, we have a system of online reporting, which is called uh, data acquisition portal. So it will be, uh, you know, digitalized and then we will receive the, uh, regular uh, returns from the commercial banks on all these fronts. Okay, thank you so much. This is actually very insightful.
wonderful. It's very interesting to know, you know, the initiatives that you ha- we have uh, at, at, a, at a, a state level has been taken in the last uh, three to five years are now uh, f- taking fruit, right? Like we are actually getting enough data to to actually change policies or create policies um, for the different income groups. Um, we're nearly at time. Uh, so just wanted to wrap up and ask, you know, some final thoughts, um, you know, Amna there, you maybe you will have something to add. Um, on this side in terms of data aggregated, um, gender data aggregation, right? Like that, that is a very tough um, space to talk about or get information, but what is your thoughts and any final thoughts you have on um, women and financial inclusion and where we should be going or what you think should happen in the next few years? Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, just on the data side, uh, it's a regular struggle for us because we all yeah. also tend to uh, bother our partners for uh, data on the interventions. And oftentimes, when we demand them, then they have to run the separate query. They have to run a separate process <laughs> to map consumers with the identification numbers, and then they can report gender disaggregated data. Otherwise, it's not a normal business practice. And what that means is, if you don't Absolutely. know the breakdown of your consumers, then you can't even target them properly and you can't design the right strategies or products or communication pitch to uh, attract more women. Uh, so that is why we insist on having this uh, separate data for both genders helps us to assess the impact of our interventions. But that also means that businesses will be more strategic in uh, targeting women. Uh, so, and yeah, once we have better data, then that should improve uh, intervention design as well for all actors involved. Uh, just as a, a final parting thought, so I, I think, uh, unfortunately, this year, because of the way things have changed, the uh, digital financial services have uh, increased in popularity. So that is one uh, positive impact of the crisis that we all had to face. And also, in the meantime, what we did notice was that while it had been assumed that women are not into technology, that's not correct. Women were the ones who were uh, making payments for school fees. They were making payments for utility bills as well. Uh, so that is something that needs to be uh, encouraged. And since now we know that women are comfortable with technology, so that means we need to build on this platform and continue to offer them more services through these uh, channels as well. We've seen improvement happening in that space in this year, but that needs to uh, continue in the future as well, because otherwise we mentioned a, of a couple of barriers, including mobility and information. So technology is the cheapest way you can address all of those barriers. And thus, uh, we hope to see more innovation in that space uh, going forward. Okay, uh, if I if I may say, uh, uh, you know, uh, the last thing from the the state bank side, uh, because. I think we are still connected, right? Yes. Um, do you guys can hear me? Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. So, uh, you know, I wanted to make a point about, you know, the gender thank policy. Thank you so much, you... Amna. Um, I think as we wrap up, the internet connection for all three of us. Is sort of... <laughs> uh, okay. Sorry, well, I, I apologize. We... Okay. So uh, before we, you wrap up, I would like to uh, mention about the gender policy that we are trying to bring. Uh, Parva? Yes, absolutely. Please. Okay. So uh, what we are trying to do, and I'll do that quickly, you know, is uh, to prioritize uh, gender specific uh, fo- focus policies through state bank and also uh, introduce a gender lens within the financial institutions through five pillars. And those five pillars are that, you know, globally, if we look at the uh, uh, financial sectors are the largest job providers to women, actually, and that has been missing in Pakistan. So we would like to see that there should be more women in financial sector. And then we uh, will set a baseline and we'll set targets for financial institutions to raise their gender uh, women participation level. So that will not only bring in, you know, more women. Uh, in terms of economic participation, but at the same time, there will be a gender focus developed within that. Uh, we would like to see the second uh, part is that uh, women-centric part- products and services have to be there. So once the, uh, the labor force or the workforce of financial sector, uh, you know, uh, has gender 
participation. We will see some uh, strong action on that front. Uh, we want gender de dedicated desk within each financial, uh, you know, uh, service point, access point. So every branch will have a gender desk there who will be trained on gender sensitivity, uh, actually. So they, it will be equipped with actually serving women clients. Uh, the fourth uh, pillar is gender desegregated data. Uh, so that we are going to collect and we are going to disseminate that in, you know, uh, on the existing financial services. And also that will help us build the targets. Finally, we are going to uh, create a policy forum on gender, which will be chaired by a state bank governor and there will be participation for both public and private sector so that we uh, not only set these targets uh, through a consultative mechanism, but at the same time, we also monitor them. Uh, the first three actions are related to financial service providers. The last two actions are related to state bank. Uh, state bank is committed to make um, bring in more women as well in its workforce. So that is another you know target that we are internally going to adopt. So that's broadly the gender framework that we are about to launch uh, early in January this year, next year. Sorry. Okay. Over. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Nursab, to be honest, has been very insightful to hear uh, not only the pillars, but your, a lot of the policies you've spoken about on gender. You know, I think um, our greater audience really wanted to understand uh, the perspective from State Bank as well. And Amna, from your side, you have had thoroughly, like, you know, we've really talked about not only from a female perspective, I'm sure, but also from the development sector which uh, brings a holistic you know, sense to, to this talk of women and financial inclusion and I mean, what you're seeing on ground as well. Thank you both so much. Um, this is coming to an end. A lot of some of the, the internet is also going up and down now. So it's, I think it's a sign. Um, thank you very, very much. It's been a wonderful, uh, I'm really happy that I've been able to moderate and, and listen in on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you um, very much. Thank you, uh, Farwa, for moderating that talk. I like the way it was uh, layered. There was so much discussed. Uh, special thank you to your, both your guests, Amna Awan and Noor Ahmad Saab. Uh, um, just to recap, uh, because I think it's such an important conversation to be had. Um, the fact that if we start with what Amna talked about is the fact that you require innovation at this particular stage to be more uh, uh, female friendly or female centric. Uh, unfortunately, due to cultural uh, constraints, we haven't been able to include uh, the women population. As uh, Amnawan's colleague uh, Halima said, that we have half of it, uh, half of our population are female. And the best part is there is willingness for women to come out and work. Um, and you can see that in multiple uh, strata in society. If you even go up to Gilgit Baltistan, you'll see that there's so many women working over there independently and running their homes, uh, even in the uh, urban areas. You know, I mean, even if if you talk about not so much in the in the formal workplace, but even in schools, and there are so many of them. All your all your teachers, majority of them are women. So it's never been the case that women have uh, shied away from work. I think now it's a time, as uh, Mr. Noor Ahmed said, that, you know, banks and uh, various institutions step forward and bring in policies that facilitate um, systems and structures that allow women to uh, be working and to be financially included. Because let's face it, culturally also, we see a lot of women who manage uh, the money. You see them grocery shopping. They're the ones who control uh, how much is spent on what and where. Um, so even if they're not working women, for those women, even if they're homemakers, to be managing finances is extremely important. And it's so reassuring to hear the state bank uh, say that they are moving towards policies that will facilitate this. So uh, as our previous talks have also said, there's a great deal of uh, anticipation and we are at a very exciting point in our uh, lives, uh, especially in a country like Pakistan. So there's a lot to look forward to. Um, at this point, we will be uh, taking a lunch break, but we do have master classes scheduled and uh, we do have our second day that is scheduled from tomorrow. I believe we kick off at 10 a.m. Pakistan time. So I hope you all uh, tune in uh, on Facebook as well as through uh, through the various portals. 
So we'll look forward to meeting you all tomorrow then.